How inbred is Tucson Kamun? Yes, this video has been a long time coming. Almost two years ago now, I mentioned in one of my first videos that Tutankhamun Kamun ranked as one of the most inbred people to have ever lived. I briefly explained how inbred Tutankhamun was in my video about the most inbred families in history, but I did not go into detail there about just how inbred Tutankhamun was, and so this brings us to today's video. How inbred is Tutankhamun? Before we plunge right in with exploring this, this video contains three different sections. The first section outlines the family of Tutankhamun and his family tree, which is messy to say the least. The second part of the video will outline how Tutankhamun's reign facilitated inbreeding, and we can outright call it incest. The final and most important part of the video will cover just how inbred Tutankhamun really is. As always, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to leave a like and a comment, as that really helps me out. And without further ado, let's move on to today's video. Tutankhamun's family were from the 18th dynasty of pharaohs to reign over ancient Egypt. According to the Pantheon of Gods, divine marriage was a way to protect the sacred bloodline of the pharaohs and their children. As such, marrying one another, particularly brother and sister, was an imperative maxim of royal performance. The 18th dynasty were no exception when it came to keeping the bloodline pure. Fortunately, the 18th dynasty is perhaps the most documented of all of the ancient pharaoh dynasties until the arrival of the Ptolemaic family in the 3rd century BCE. The founder of the 18th dynasty was Ahmose I, who married his full sister Nefertari. Together, they were ancestors to the rest of the family and were therefore direct ancestors to Tutankhamun. Their two surviving grandchildren, Ahmose and Tutmose, were married and together they had one daughter, Hatshepsut. As we will see, many pharaohs also married close female relatives because they understood that female members of the family were of incredible importance and together their child would be seen as having the strongest claim to be the next pharaoh. Over the next five generations, the tradition of marrying siblings seemed to end due to the realities of inbreeding, premature death and lack of siblings. Tutmose III, Amenhotep II, Tutmose IV and Amenhotep III all married people from outside of the agnatic line of the 18th dynasty, which means a direct descendant of the pharaoh Ahmose I. However, by the time of Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten was born, the shift of power changed once again to a point that rendered marrying relatives necessary once more. Now, Akhenaten realised that marrying his cousin, a member of this powerful family, would subdue any rivals to the throne. But there is also another reason why Akhenaten married his cousin, known as Nefertiti. In fact, Nefertiti wasn't inbred at all, and she was viewed as one of the most beautiful women in ancient Egypt. It's no surprise that Akhenaten fell in love with her. Still, Akhenaten was made to marry his full sister to respect the gods and their example. It's believed that this unknown royal woman, not Nefertiti, was the mother to Tutankhamun, although this will be discussed more in the final part of today's video. For now, let's keep in mind that Akhenaten and Nefertiti, in a love match, produced six children, including the future wife to Tutankhamun and Kesenamun. Once Tutankhamun turned 15, it was expected that he should continue the precedent of his late father and marry a relative to produce children who had a pure bloodline. He had a choice of six royal women, all of his half-sisters, and he chose Ankesenamun, presumably based on her appearance and personality. Ankesenamun is perhaps one of the most interesting royal wives. A letter that she wrote survives to this day, and that means that the letter is 3,400 years old. We will discuss this letter because it's fascinating and really important for today's video, but first, let's discuss the inbreeding caused by Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun and Ankesenamun were married for only two years, but during which they had two children together. Unfortunately, both of their daughters were stillborn and died from diseases intensified by the inbreeding of their parents. Tutankhamun died at the age of 18, and the cause of his death has been subject to much historiographical debate. It was originally believed that Tutankhamun died from murder, 
due to the apparent fracture on his skull, but this was later disproven. Historians are now unanimous in their belief that Tutankhamun died indirectly due to his inbreeding. When archaeologists excavated Tutankhamun's mummy, they found many evidences of inbreeding, most notably sickle cell disease, epilepsy and clubfoot. The latter was an affliction suffered by most members of his close family, including his sister, likely mother and presumed father. When he died, he left his 21-year-old wife a widow and almost immediately she was seen as a threat to the new pharaoh's rule, I. Very soon after her husband died, Ankesinaman wrote a 3,400-year-old letter which is incredibly cryptic. She sent this letter to the ruler of the Hittites, who occupied modern-day Turkey. The letter reads, My husband has died and I have no son. They say about you that you have many sons. You might give me one of your sons to become my husband. I would not wish to take one of my subjects as a husband, I am afraid. In the history of ancient Egypt, this is completely extraordinary, since ancient Egyptian royals were seen vastly superior to outsiders. Within a year, Ankesinaman was dead. Shortly after, she and the new pharaoh, I, married. When she died, she was placed in the same grave as her great-grandmother, Mutemwia meaning that she was hurriedly buried as if to erase any memory of her. Tutankhamun's death was indirectly the result of his inbreeding. His two daughters too died due to inbreeding complications and so it looks likely that Tutankhamun's inbreeding level would also be high. Now, let's work out precisely just how inbred Tutankhamun is using the consanguinity coefficient. If you haven't heard of that before, I suggest that you go and check out this video, which I have attached in the video description too. Now, when we look at Tutankhamun's ancestry as a whole, this would be difficult, knowing that he has plenty of inbred ancestors. However, by the time of his grandfather, Amenhotep III's birth, the family had not been conducting incestuous matches for four whole generations, meaning that Amenhotep III was almost entirely not inbred. Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten II, was not inbred since his mother, Tia, was from a non-royal family in Egypt. As Tia and Amenhotep III were not related, their many children, at least nine, were able to live relatively healthy lives. The issue of inbreeding only came about once again in the 18th dynasty once Akhenaten married someone who was not of the royal family, but was also his cousin, Nefertiti. Nefertiti was the mother, without doubt, to Tutankhamun's wife. Egyptologists are conflicted, however, over who Tutankhamun's mother was. Since Tutankhamun was incredibly inbred, being a child of first cousins would be unlikely, since he would only have a consanguinity coefficient of about 0.07 or 7%. So this means that Nefertiti was not his mother. This was also later shown as untrue because in 2010, DNA testing on a seemingly unimportant mummy known as the Younger Lady proved to have been Tutankhamun's mother. The same DNA test also proved her to be the full sister of the pharaoh Akhenaten. Now, this makes sense when we take into account how inbred Tutankhamun was. He was the child of full siblings. Fortunately, his grandmother Tia was not inbred and Amenhotep III only had a slight inbred level due to the messy decisions of his ancestors. This means that Tutankhamun had an inbreeding level of roughly 0.26 or 26%, a mere 0.2% higher than Charles II of Spain for comparison. Remember, he too died young from inbreeding complications. And there we have it, how inbred Tutankhamun was. If you enjoyed today's video, please make sure to leave a like and a comment. What did you find the most interesting about today's video? Let me know in the comments section below and as always, I am the Shy Historian and stay tuned for many more.